We live, we love, we serve. Serve good. We are in the first Sunday of our new theme, mantra, declaration, really, for the year. I am a disciple. And this first month of the year, we usually talk intentionally about the theme. But really, this theme is going to guide us for the entire year of 2024. Before I read the scripture, I got to shout out somebody today. I don't often do this, but I got to do it today because uh, he's been here with me and we, God has been using him and, and to do some great work here at FCBC. But today marks 17 years that Dante has been here at FCBC with us. Seventeen years. So, time. He re, he re, he reminded me of that this morning. Time flies. It makes sense. This year I'll be twenty years, so that makes sense for me. So, thank God for for His gifts um, here at FCBC. This year is going to be challenging, beloved, especially as these sermons come from this pulpit. It will be challenging um, and there may be some people through the course of this year may have a hard time with some of the messages but you'll be okay um, this is a pivotal year for us it in so many ways this 20th year is a culmination of so many years of teaching here but really challenging us to walk fully in who we are called to be not as members of FCBC not even just as Christians but as disciples of the teachings and followers of the carpenter. And so today I want to lift up a passage, uh, Matthew 5. It is frequently referred to as the Beatitudes. Um, and I want to read it from verse 1 through 12. And so just bear with me. I want to read it from the NRSV and, and the uh, Message Bible today. This is the word of God. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Bless, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Message Bible reads it like this. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing large crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you are at the end of your rope, with less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside, when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right, then you see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's kingdom and God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. 
What it means is that the truth is no close is too close too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. <clears throat> Come on, beloved. Let's pray. God, in our lives, we've taken so many chances and made so many choices. But now, oh God, we want to take a chance and make a choice to be your disciples, oh God. But God, in this season, in this moment, in this time, disciples must be made. God, we're honoring your call over our lives. We're honoring that assignment to go make disciples. Those of us, oh God, who are shaped by your teaching, shaped by your ministry, oh God, that you imparted upon your son, the carpenter, oh God. We stand in alignment and in solidarity today that although the assignment is challenging and even difficult, God, we declare our allegiance to discipleship, oh God. We know it won't be easy, but we also know we will not be alone, for you will be with us in this season, oh God. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful to be counted among those whom you trust. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We love you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read the Message Bible again. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him, arriving at a quiet place. He sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God in his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourself cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind, your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds and, and know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Amen. Do me a favor today. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I choose the kingdom of God. Come on, turn to your other neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I choose the kingdom of God. Put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I choose the kingdom of God of God. Matthew 4 begins with a scene that the other Gospels, the Synoptics, Mark and Luke also record. Matthew 4 begins with Jesus, Jesus being driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. 
For so long, when we've heard that story, we've often thought of Jesus being tempted by some figure named Satan. And I've always seen that scene differently. If you know the chronology of this moment, Jesus has just been baptized and confirmed as God's son. In fact, when he's baptized, the heavens open up and the voice of God could be heard, but it is directed towards Jesus. You are my son. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He is confirmed. He's validated by God. His identity is solidified. He is the beloved son of God. And then after that, he's driven into the wilderness. And there he fasts 40 days and 40 nights, it says. And then at the end of that fasting where he is empty, then he is tempted. He was empty. And then tempted. And the temptations come. I mean, the first temptation makes sense in many ways, you know. He's been there fasting 40 days, 40 nights, and, and the temptation comes. But before I talk about the temptation, let me say something. I think that oftentimes we have these moments when who we are is almost solidified, confirmed by God in many ways. The temptation is not really about whether Satan comes to tempt us. I think in many ways the temptations are internal rumblings and internal wrestling with the things we desire versus the assignment we said yes to. I hope you could get that here today. I, I'm saying that once you say yes to the assignment that God has placed on your life, or even yes to being a disciple, that what happens next is not some enemy sitting on your shoulder tempting you, but it is you, you wrestling with the nature of the things you've desired versus what you've signed on to. And sometimes what you sign on to with God is contrary to even the things you desire. Can you imagine when you sign on to this journey as a disciple and somehow it bumps heads with the things that really lurk in the place of your deepest desires. Especially when you know a life that has been shaped by poverty like Jesus, a life that has been shaped by oppression like Jesus. You can only imagine what that internal rumbling could be. Here you are, affirmed, confirmed by God, gifted to do things beyond measure, with insight, beyond imagination. And here you were being driven into the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights, no food, nothing, fasting. And then the temptation comes. And look at the first internal wrestling you experience. If you are who you claim to be, well, then you should have the capacity to turn these stones into bread. I mean, when you're hungry and you have the ability, why don't you feed yourself, Jesus? And that is an internal warfare. Use your gifts to bless yourself. Turn these stones to bread. And then Jesus makes it clear. No, no. He, now in the midst of that one voice that says, turn the stones to bread, there's a deeper voice that says, well, yeah, but remember what the scrolls say. We do not live by bread alone. I love Howard Thurman in his book called The Temptations. He said that there must have been a desert and a sea between those two words, bread and alone. We do not live by bread, but you do need bread to eat. We do not live by bread, but we do need bread to be sustained. But it's alone. It's not that we don't need bread, but that can't be the only thing we desire to satisfy our physical needs alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And then that same struggle he's taken in his own life, in his own self, to the pinnacle of the temple, to the holy city in Jerusalem. The temptation is if you really are who you claim to be, the scripture says if you're the Messiah, that angels will protect the Messiah, will not allow your feet to hit one stone, will not allow you to be crushed. Try it, test it. That is not something that Satan sits on your shoulder and says, those are the things we wrestle through when we're not always confirmed and feel confident about who we are. Those are the testings we put ourselves through. If I am who I claim to be and who God said I am, then yeah, God will protect me. But then there's this other voice that says, do not put God to the test. And finally, he finds himself now on the mountain, and he can see from that mountain all the kingdoms of the world in all their splendor, and he hears a voice say, worship me. Now, if this is an internal rumbling, imagine what it feels like. Worship yourself. Oh, gosh, you're not getting that. Worship yourself. Be so consumed with yourself, and you can have the kingdoms of this world. Be selfish, and you can get the world. Be greedy and you can get the world. Don't care about anybody else and you can get the world. And then that word comes rumbling back in his spirit. 
Worship the God and God alone. That's the temptation scene as Matthew gives it. And then from there, Jesus leaves. He begins to hear that John has been arrested after his temptation. He comes out now fortified, ready to move forward in public ministry. He then sees Peter and Andrew. This is how Matthew categorizes it. Peter and Andrew, he sees, he says, come follow me. They drop their nets and follow Jesus. Then he moves on. He sees Zebedee's sons, John and James. He tells them to follow him, and they follow, and they leave. And from there, they go back to the Galilee, back to Capernaum, where he had made his house, and he begins to heal people who are brought to him. He heals them, and he heals every one of them. And then he goes to Peter's house, in front of Peter's house, and he hears that Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and he goes in there and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. From that moment, they really start bombarding him with people who are sick, and they bring them to Jesus to heal them. And it says he heals every one of them. I mean, imagine, he came out of the wilderness being tempted, wrestling with himself. He comes out, begins public ministry. He calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and then he starts healing everybody and teaching in all the synagogues. He's healing and teaching, teaching and healing. And here's what it says in Matthew 4. His fame grew and spread throughout the region. He is the carpenter who in a matter of days goes from questioning his identity to being confirmed by God to then choosing new disciples to now healing and teaching, teaching and healing throughout all the synagogues in the Galilee region and his fame grew. The crowds grew large. It said people followed him from Galilee, from the Decapolis. Let me help you understand. The, Ga the Galilee was not one place. It was an area filled with numerous cities. The Decapolis were 10 cities of the Roman subdivision across from where the Jews inhabited. And then it said people follow from, uh, from the Galilee, from the Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, and across the Jordan. The throngs of people followed him. This moved quickly. Throngs of people following him. And Matthew 1, or rather 5, verse 1 says this, when he saw the crowds, Elisha, he left. When he saw the crowds, he left and went up to the mountain. I often think in my mind, maybe he went back to the mountain that he went to when he was in the wilderness and he began to see the kingdoms of the world and he saw that temptation, that temptation to have wealth and power and attention and fame and celebrity, that temptation to hijack the mission and make it about you and your platform and your self-aggrandizing ways to forfeit the mission and just make it about you and what you can get and what you can have and get all the attention of people uh, that you may need maybe because of your own insecurity to forfeit the mission he goes back to the mountain he remembers the temptation to see the world and it's right there happening people were following him his fame grew everybody wanted to get close to him and he leaves that space because it is a critical moment in his journey that kingdom of the world, all that the world can give, they're there right now, ready to make him king, ready to celebrate him. His fame was growing. He was becoming a celebrity in that region. And he leaves all of that, goes back to the mountain, and instead of looking at the kingdoms of this world, he realizes he has a responsibility to the kingdom of God. And he goes up, and here's the part I love. The disciples follow him. And he sat down and begins to teach them. The disciples follow him. And he sits down and begins to teach them. I'm going to say it again. The disciples follow him. And he sits down and they sit down. He begins to teach. He leaves the crowd and teaches his disciples. This, Matthew 5, is the beginning of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is considered Jesus' greatest teaching, Jesus' greatest sermon. Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, as we have it, is Jesus' greatest teaching. And he teaches it to the disciples. No, you didn't get it yet. Well, let me help you understand. It is not until Matthew 10 that he gets the full 12. But here in Matthew 5, there are only four. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. 
and they go up with him, and he teaches them. But it's only four of them. That the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached was only heard by four people. He leaves the crowd and goes to the mountain to teach his four, as the Message Bible put it, climbing companions. These teachings are the teachings that shape and define the kingdom. These are Jesus' teachings on what it means to be part of the kingdom. And only four people got it. Y'all missed it. He left the crowds who came to see to teach the people who took a chance and made a choice to follow him. That's why I often remind my colleagues and those who I've been blessed to mentor, don't be caught up in crowds. Don't be caught up in the numbers of people. It is a beautiful thing to see these numbers and to come to worship and experience this. But when it comes to discipleship, it's not always a popular choice. Because as Matthew put it, Jesus goes to Peter and Andrew, and he goes to them and says, follow me. They drop everything. Follow him. He goes to James and John. Follow me. They drop everything. They drop everything. James and John leave their father holding the nets. And they follow him. And what's the reward? They were taught what the kingdom was like. Right at the moment where Jesus could have fallen into the kingdoms of this world, all the fame, the celebrity, the celebration, all of that, he walks away from all of that, all of those things that so many of us crave, even today. The attention, the celebrity, the notoriety, the fame, the celebration, the recognition. He leaves all the things that we crave today to teach for people what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. He doesn't even teach the crowd this. He's not enamored by the crowd because he, every, he understands everybody can't climb every mountain. That's why the Message Bible says his climbing companions. Everybody doesn't go the next step. We are a community, a culture of convenience, and we do what comes easy. We gravitate towards what comes easy. But here, the reward for climbing a little higher is to hear what you've never heard before and to be introduced to this idea of what it means to be a disciple in the kingdom of God. And then he begins to teach what we now call the Beatitudes. And the issue is that what he begins to teach about the kingdom, it is uncomfortable and disconcerting to us. He begins to teach and he calls every beatitude we call blessed. He blesses. Blessed. This is blessed. This is blessed. And when you read that list, it don't look like it's really something that is blessed. Think about it. Look at how the NRSV describes it. Blessed are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Everyone who seemingly is not having a good moment or experiencing challenges, these folk are blessed in the kingdom of God and when and when Jesus gives the word blessed here it is not necessarily an indicative mood in the Greek it is not or rather it is not an imperative it is an indicative in other words it is not a prescription it is a description and you didn't catch that he's not saying do these things and you're blessed that would be prescriptive he's saying blessed are those who do these things that's a description that those who do these things in the kingdom are blessed. The problem is those who are blessed in the kingdom are not look very favorable in the rest of the world. I'm not making a dichotomy between the kingdom and the world, but I am making a distinction about what it means to be a disciple because the disciples are the ones who are hearing this, that all the things that they may have thought made their life miserable. Jesus now says you're blessed because of it. I hope you can capture this today. These are poor, four poor men who live under oppression, oppressive regime, who are struggling for daily sustenance, who are trying to take care of families when most of the people dying that they see are dying from malnutrition. They are mostly illiterate. They don't have all 
all the trappings of success. They are not wealthy. They do not have power. In fact, they have the opposite of power. And he takes those four men who've been struggling just to make sense of life, who've been struggling just to take care of their families, and he tells them, you all are blessed. I don't care what the world says about you. I don't care how the world sees you. But in God's kingdom, you are blessed. There is favor found. Can you imagine what that word would have unleashed to people who don't see themselves of anything but to be told for the first time that God favors you in your situation? You are blessed. You see, here's the problem. In our culture, the meek don't get rewarded. They get run over. In our culture, those who are merciful are viewed as foolish for allowing people to get over on them. In this culture, mourning is tolerated just for a little while, but then we tell folk, get over it. It's been too long now. In this culture, we shift it. In this culture, here's what we say, and I got this from Daniel. He's a professor at Bright Divinity School. He said, blessed are the well-educated. They get the good jobs. Blessed are the well-connected, for their aspirations will not go unnoticed. Blessed are you when you know what you want and go after it with everything you got, for God helps those who help themselves. That's the economy of the culture. That's not the economy of the kingdom. That's what I hope you get today. What the kingdom desires and requires is not the same as culture. Blessed are you when you have all the material goods that you can buy because yours is the emptiness of the spirit. Blessed are you when you support capitalistic regimes, but you don't try to take care of those who are dying in part. That's what the culture says. Look out for yourself. Look out for what you need to get. And God will bless your hard work, your grind. But what about those on the underside of culture who struggle with life, who struggle to make sense of life who are trying to just eat and take care of their family and take care of their children moving from shelter to shelter and are unhoused they are blessed too he's talking to four people and teaching them that in God's kingdom everything that is affirmed by the culture is turned upside down and you are part of this community to live in this way. That's what it means to be a disciple. You see, if it were easy, we would not have shifted the focus to getting members. Oh, you missed that. If it were easy, we would not have shifted the focus to save souls. If it were easy, we would be all making disciples. But that is the commandment of Jesus. But it ain't easy. Especially when you wrestle with the temptations connected to your deep desires and things you really want. You can hear me saying this right now and then you go from hearing me say this and you start scrolling through social media and, and you start wondering why I ain't got this and why I ain't living life like this and, and what is it about me that I'm missing out on all this? And you start thinking something is wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with you. You are fine just the way you are. But you understand that when you become a disciple, you begin to point to another way of being in this world. It doesn't mean that you live some monastic life or you live in the, off in the desert somewhere. No, it means that you are a glimpse of the kingdom right here, right now, in this space. No matter where you go, you represent the kingdom. And again, I don't even get mad when everybody doesn't get it because Jesus also got that. He left the crowds and went up the mountain with four people and began to pour into them. You don't measure the efficacy of your work by the number of people who follow. You don't measure how successful you are by the number of people who move towards what God has called you to do. You measure it by your commitment to the assignment. And here it is. Sometimes the assignments don't get you the celebrity you may desire. 
Sometimes the assignment don't get you the wealth you crave. This is why elsewhere Jesus will say, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world but lose the soul? I want you to hear me. This is not a call to poverty and a call to just give. No, it is a call to pointing to another way. You live your life, but know that the things that we find ourselves doing to fit into culture don't have the final word. There's a deeper place known as the kingdom of God. And I have to believe that it's a reality that to, is to be experienced right here because in the prayer Jesus teaches his disciples, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. So that means there's a possibility and a belief that what the kingdom is ought not just be experienced when you die, but right where you are. But hear this, whose responsibility is it to see that the kingdom comes alive? Disciples' responsibility. Yes. Yes. It is our responsibility. That is what we are called to do. Discipleship is again about taking a chance and make a choice. And the chance is to be a disciple. The choice is to be a disciple, but it means something. It doesn't just mean showing up here on one day a week. It means ordering your life in a different way. It means that the things that used to drive you connected to materialism and fame and attention ought not drive you. Because as the Message Bible put it, that when you seek God, you become the owner of things that money can't buy. Your discipleship. It's about being a light. In fact, if you read the rest of chapter 5 after verse 12, he begins to talk about we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. That you can't lose your saltiness or your light. Don't hide it. After he tells them all these things, he tells them you are salt and light. You are what the world needs and doesn't even know it needs you. You will represent the very thing that can turn this world around. And the world doesn't always see it. You. So when you turn on the TV or you read the newspaper, you read on your phone or tablet how bad the world is and how many things are going on and how many people are dying and how many people are hungry and how many families are being destroyed and how many babies are being blown up. And you're trying to figure out, God, when will this end? And I hear God coming back, when will you begin? When will you begin? Because when you begin, the end begins. When you begin to take this call seriously, the end begins. When you live this life according to the teachings of the carpenter, when you begin that, you have no idea the shift that begins to take place. The world ain't thirsty for no more Christians. The world is dying for disciples. And I realize that everybody's not there, and that's okay. Because my responsibility is not to get you there. It's to plant the seed. And let God give the increase, beloved. I made up a long time ago. I decided a long time ago that I choose the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that somehow we live lives of perfection, that from the moment we make this choice and all of a sudden, in the snap of a finger, everything about us has changed. No. We still struggle with ourselves. We still struggle with our humanity. We still struggle with those desires. But the more you lean in, the more you are equipped to overpower the things that had power over you. The more you lean in, the more you are equipped the more you lean in, the more you are empowered to be able to move through this world with peace and grace, with joy and love, yes. to not try to compete. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
those who seek to bring peace, those who seek to stop the bitterness and the competitiveness and the animosity. Blessed are those people. Blessed are those people who allow their mind and their heart to be transformed by the empowering love of God. Blessed are those people who feel like somehow they've lost everything and at the same time have the same feeling of gaining everything from God. Blessed are those people who thirst and hunger for righteousness, to see things right where things seem so wrong. Blessed are you for wanting that. Blessed are you for wanting people to realize that they have value in God's kingdom. Blessed are you when you live, you love, and you serve. Blessed are you when you realize that this world can't give you the things that will contribute to your emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being. Blessed are you when you realize it's not about how much money you got, but how much love you give. Blessed are you when you recognize that it's not about how much better you are than somebody else. It's about how you help somebody else get better. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. When you're not so selfish with your gift that you don't know how to share the gift and have other people grow from your gift. Blessed are you when you choose to be a disciple. If you read this story, you journey with us this year, what you'll realize is that being a disciple don't happen overnight. It takes time, but it doesn't happen without a commitment. It doesn't happen without you beginning to honor that commitment. That's why that song is so profound. The first time I heard it years ago, I'm the one. I'm the one you're looking for, Jesus. I'm the one. I'm the one you, you're looking for. Are you that one today that Jesus has been looking for? Who would climb up a little higher to learn a little deeper. Are you that one who feels that deep and abiding commitment to turn this world upside down? Are you the one who's willing to show that there's another way of being in this world? And it's not about power and money and fame and wealth. It's about love, peace, justice. Are you that one today? who's willing to walk another path and march to a different drumbeat. Are you that one today? Well, instead of closing your life, you're willing to open your heart. Are you that one today? With something your soul shakes to hear and see the cries of children in another part of this world because you realize that although they may be far away, they're still your children. Are you that one today? Because if you're that one, the world has been waiting for you to show what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. I choose the kingdom of God, beloved, because I know there's another way of being in this world. There's another way of showing up in this world, and we are supposed to point to that way. Churches can't become commodities of capitalism. Preachers can't be poster children for capitalism. Houses of worship have to be places of healing and restoration. We have that responsibility. And I choose the kingdom of God. Do me a favor, stand on your feet today. I want you to sing that song again, Dante. I'm the one. Just listen to these words again. Just listen, beloved. When you read in Matthew 4, the calling of Peter, Andrew, James, and John, it seems so quick. Follow me. They leave everything they follow. And here's the thing. They made a decision to follow without fully understanding what it meant without even knowing fully what they would learn or what they would do. They made a decision they were willing to follow another way. Because sometimes we think, well, maybe 
Pastor, I don't know enough Bible. I ain't been to church enough. Or I'm still doing things that. But discipleship is a journey. It is not a destination. You make a decision to take this journey with all the ups and downs and with all your flaws and misgivings. Because the declaration is saying, I'm willing to be and show up another way in spite of my imperfection. So I want to pray today for those who feel in their spirit that they really want to be disciples. No judgment today. This is a year-long journey we're taking. Just today, there may be somebody here who says, I want to learn. I want to become. And I believe that God will receive me just as I am to do this deeper work, this kingdom building work for disciples build kingdom. So if you're here today, beloved, you really want to begin this journey today. I want you to come because I want to pray with you. And again, no judgment. This may not be everybody. I will come running to your arms. Those who are in the balcony, you just raise your hand. I know you can't get down. Just raise your hand. It's easy. For so long, many of us, including myself, we grew up in church and sometimes depending on the church you were part of you always walked around with this feeling of unworthiness that you weren't good enough I mean the language was reinforcing that sometimes you came to church and you ended up more broken when you left or you came and felt ridiculed because of who you were and chastised were hurt by a place that was supposed to heal but when you look at the teachings of the carpenter when you look at that movement he led look at the people who followed look at the people who took a chance and made a choice look at the disciples sometimes they made mistakes sometimes they said the wrong thing sometimes they did the wrong things but yet Jesus still trusted them with the kingdom. Weren't perfect. Didn't always have it all together. Up until the day that they get the assignment to make disciples, they still struggling with themselves. And yet Jesus trusted them. This is not a call to perfection. This is a call to discipleship. Knowing that there's a cost to this, it is not easy. Because as you grow in the journey, in the movement, you start realizing a, a shifting of priorities. Whereas there was a time you wanted to be impressive, now you want to be impactful. Whereas there was a time you wanted to be seen, now you want to serve. When it was a time when it was all about you, now you realize you've been gifted for everyone else. That's part of the journey. That's part of the learning. It's a shifting. And by declaring a desire to be a disciple, all you're saying is really simply, God, I want to be available to be caught part of this kingdom building work. I'm available. And you know my issues, you know my struggle, but also, God, you know the power you possess to heal me. But the good news is that while God is working on you, God can work through you. While God is working with you, God can use you to be a breakthrough for somebody else. That's what the call is. Because when you look at those disciples, when you look at those who heard these words, they didn't have it together. They showed up open to learn.
That's the requirement, beloved. God, I want to be open to learn, open to grow, available to be used. God, have your way in our lives. God, so many of us have gone through so much and sometimes, oh God, we don't feel like we're worthy of the assignment, that we're worthy of the call, that we're worthy to do your work. But God, that's why we know grace is real. We know mercy is real, oh God. Because it is through grace that you find us worthy. Through your love that you cover us. God, thank you. God, we come now declaring our desire to take this journey with you. God, we are heavy from the pain in this world. We are heavy from the violence in this world. We are heavy because it seems like life doesn't mean much anymore. But God, that's why you're calling us now begin to carve out new paths to show a different way the good news oh God is that it's not a new way it's just an old way that's been avoided we choose the kingdom of God we choose the life of discipleship we choose oh God to every day have our mind blown by the, blown by the assignment oh God take a chance today we make a choice we are the ones we are the ones God we will follow and wherever you lead us we will follow God we thank you Lord we honor you God God use us use us oh God Use us, O oh God, to be beacons of hope and sources of strength. Give us a deep hunger for healing, O oh God, for restoration, O oh God, for peace, O oh God. God, we want to be the peacemakers, O oh God. Use us, O oh God, so that in the midst of the pain people can see the possibilities use us oh God use us oh God we are the ones oh God thank you for seeing us as worthy even when other people don't thank you for seeing us as valuable when other people don't thank you for loving us when other people refuse to thank you for holding us when people don't want to draw close to us thank you thank you thank you God we love you Lord we honor you God and it's in your name we pray we say amen Amen. Amen. Come on, let's go to God. Now unto you, O God, who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless in your presence. Continue to remind us, O God, that we have to not only choose the kingdom, but keep on choosing it every day. For every day is filled with challenges that design to pull us away from this journey, pull us away from this work, pull us away from this kingdom. But God, we choose the kingdom today now until we meet again on the other side where the sun neither rises nor sets because the sun is Jesus the Christ the light of the world we thank you God we love you Lord and it's in your name we pray amen amen listen have an amazing day brothers who plan on being here tomorrow night make sure you sign up outside as well God bless have an amazing day